Russo and kick off the national championship game. Chris Fowler, along with Lee Corso and Craig James, we'll hear these guys' final thoughts on the ball game in just a couple of minutes. But first of all, we want to summarize yet another bowl week. I mean, for the players and coaches, these things tend to be an almost endless stream of obligations, press conferences, dumb questions, etc. This week we've had our share of odd situations, including an elephant track controversy. Here are some of the highlights and lowlights. If you lose this ball game, you're opening yourself up for a lot of criticism, not going with the guy that brought you here. You know the old philosophy. Mm -hmm. We have thought press on that. Well, I'm going to be criticized no matter what we do. If we lose, Lee, you know that. <laughs> and you'll be one of the guys. No, I won't. I'm, I'm, I'm second-guessing you before the you'll game. You'll be leading the charge. No, sir. I'm second-guessing you guy. before the game. It's going to be a heck of a football game. And there's no question about it. Our practices have gone good. Only one injury, me. And uh, I hurt my knee. I won't get it shot up on game day. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you come out of retirement? I'm good. If you guys are blocking, I'm coming out, big boy. I'm in from Miami. They're going to need you. I was trying to explain who was going to play quarterback for Lee Corso. It took me about six hours. And, uh, How tall are you? Because I tell you what, I eat spaghetti off your head. How tall are you? Lee's kind of a slow study, as you know. Well, it's hard to get him close. Which one of those is coming? I hope it's the biggest one, so I'm ready. And then where, 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 what hospital will you be going to after that? <laughs> no, I'll be, I'll be celebrating after the game. We're going to, you know, hit him probably a little bit harder than anybody else has hit him. <laughs> Just be for real. We have to hop over the elephant tracks. Uh, <laughs> that'll make make for some interesting play calls. We have to avoid the elephant tracks. Ah, uh, yes, the elephants in the halftime show. This ball kind of takes on the characteristics of this city: zany, chaotic, unpredictable at times. Let's hope you guys can uh, boil this game down now in the final few hours before kickoff. Give us your checklist as we compare some of the key categories for these teams. Well, Chris, when discussing a winner in this ball game, there's certain areas I'd like to discuss. First of all, up front in the trenches. Now, I like Nebraska here because I think their offensive line will be one of the best in the history. That's the advantage. Quarterback play. I like Nebraska for two reasons. Tommy Frazier, Brooke Barringer. One can run, the other can throw. Special teams. I like Nebraska because of Darren Erstad. He's not only a good punter, he's a long field goal kicker. But now, I like Miami when it comes to the skill people. The reason, their height advantage near the goal line, I think that'll be a great play for them. Now, Hall of Fame coach Bob Devaney of Nebraska told me that they, he thought that Nebraska was the finest football team he had ever seen at Nebraska, and he'd been there over 40 years. I'm picking Nebraska by three points because of what Devaney says, and I think of their team speed. They're a great football team, no question about that. Now, I'm going to buy your checklist. Just right. I explained this last night to about 10,000 people. In the trenches, I'm going to have to go with Nebraska. There's no debating that their offensive line is awesome. Quarterback play, now here's really where it gets kind of tricky here. Nebraska's got some great players, but because of the opportunities man-to-man, -man, Frank Costa gets the nod there. Special teams, Dane Pruitt is 13 of 13 inside the 40-yard line. I really think it comes down to a kick in the ball game and home field advantage. There aren't enough checklist points that I could put for that one. They have lost one game, Miami that is, since 1977 at night in the Orange Bowl. It is a different monster. There is not any environment in any playoff, any environment that matches what this does. Where were those 10,000 people, by the way? Uh, I think we all agree that Nebraska is a better team on a neutral field, but you're right, the Orange Bowl the a big, big factor. Now we want to get the thoughts of the senior member of our team on this ball game, but first, we want to flash back to late August. Who will be number one on January 3rd, because the bowl games are on the second this year, except for the Orange Bowl? In the Rose Bowl, Joe Paterno will win his third national title. And Bino Cook joins us now. Happy New Year, Bino. Do you still feel the same way as you did in August? Yes, we said Nebraska would lose on New Year's Day uh, in the Orange Bowl and Penn State would win the national title. And we haven't changed. Miami 31, Nebraska 10. We are rooting in a way for Tom Osborne. We're not rooting for Nebraska. We're rooting for Tom Osborne because if he doesn't win, he's going to be criticized again. 
You know, last year officiating played a big part in this Orange Bowl, at least according to Nebraska fans, with the ACC officials, or the Big East officials, I should say. Now, what about the officials in this ball game? They're Big Ten officials tonight. Yeah. First, Chris, officials are politicians, and these are Big Ten officials, and Nebraska will not get any breaks. Let's go back to 1991. Penn State, Miami, playing during the regular season in the Orange Bowl. Big Ten officials. Three penalties against Penn State for 15 yards. 11 penalties against Miami for 124 yards. If Nebraska is able to overcome the home field, the Big Ten officials, and a very good Miami team, they deserve to be number one. But it's not going to happen. All right, Pino. Happy New Year to you. Thanks for joining us. Let's hope the officials don't play a part in this ball game. We'll be back here later on Sunday Sports Day from Miami. But coming up next, face off. Who was the best athlete of 1994? Frosted cornfields, always imposing, always highly ranked, but destined, it has seemed, for disappointment. He has these winters in his blood, the native son who never left, who in another time was twice the state's athlete of the year, a marvel who competed for his small hometown college. Tom Osborne, 22 seasons, 218 victories, 11 conference titles, but still bearing with serene dignity. The January memories. Memories of hot, humid nights in Miami. When it was all or nothing in a stadium a long, long way from home. In 1984, there was honor and defeat. Ten years later, redemption was just one play away. 45 yards to get Cinderella, Nebraska, the national championship. And though decades of success have been somehow diminished by a series of New Year's failings, the resolve remains. And now, even beyond the heartland, you sense he is, for most, the sentimental choice. I don't think there's any room for compassion. I mean, we weren't playing a football game, and if he wasn't playing us for the national championship, play would for him. To Tom Osborne, this is a familiar face of January, the face of another fierce Miami team, at home in the Orange Bowl, and prepared to deny the Cornhuskers a national title. Or is this finally the night? when Nebraska's proud native son brings to an end his long New Year's nightmare.
signifying an Orange Bowl victory and the national title, both at stake tonight. Nebraska is seeking its first national title since the Johnny Rogers team of 1971, and the first in Tom Osborne's 22-year tenure, an otherwise magnificent tenure diminished by New Year's Day and night setbacks. Osborne's teams have now lost seven straight bowl games, including the last three Orange Bowls, and tonight the opponent is Miami at home. Miami, 3-0 against Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. To get it done, Nebraska's Osborne has reinstalled Tommy Frazier as his starting quarterback. The option specialist began the year as a Heisman candidate, but he hasn't played since September 24th, stricken with blood clots in his right leg. The decision to start Frazier over Brooke Behringer, who played well in Frazier's absence, has already been second-guessed. But Tom Osborne has long since become accustomed to the scrutiny and criticism that comes with the territory. 22 seasons of excellence, icon status in his home state, yet he has never made himself larger than his team. Guarded, stoic, we probably know Tom Osborne best, not from his words, but from a moment, a defining moment, the 1984 Orange Bowl. <laughs> Choosing victory over a tie, attempting a two-point conversion, his boldness cost him the national title. And now, perhaps another defining moment. This week, choosing Tommy Frazier as his starting quarterback. I find any irony in the fact that it's easy to label you as conservative, but you're the guy who went for two when the tie assured you of the national championship. You're the guy who's rolling the dice now with Frazier. Well, I don't know, Bob. I, I don't really think in terms of image and, and those kind of things. I just think in terms of what I feel needs to be done. And Nobody wants to focus on who's playing tackle or who's playing safety. And those spots are uh, every bit as critical as quarterback. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with our quarterbacks. They're going to play okay. I'm a little bit more worried about some other spots. You know what the long-standing observations or criticisms are. Schedule's not tough enough outside of Oklahoma and in recent years Colorado. Philosophy's too conservative, run the ball between the tackles, win the Big 8 title, run up against competition you can't handle on New Year's Day. Has any of that been fair? Oh, I'm sure uh, whatever's fair, uh, whatever people say, I don't, I don't care what they say. And all I know is that uh, we've got a certain uh, climate to play in. We have a certain uh, uh, schedule that's usually set uh, six, seven, eight years in advance. And uh, we think that in our... In our uh, climactic uh, situation, uh, you, uh, you, you've got to be prepared to handle two or three bad weather days. On the other hand, not maybe Miami, if they had to play January 1st in Lincoln or in Omaha, uh, might find that their style wouldn't fit quite as well either. Here's a quote uh, from a week or so ago in the New York Times. No one ever predicts a derailing loss, but many wonder if it is their destiny. You're a practical man, but have you ever wondered if that's your destiny? Mm. Well, I, no, I really have never thought that way. Uh, we lost Oklahoma the first five or six times that I, I think that I was a head coach and played him. But I didn't feel like we were always going to lose to Oklahoma. We just tried to work harder and get better. And uh, we lost pretty badly to uh, Florida State a couple times and Miami a couple times. And we worked hard and we got better. And I think last year we, we played well enough to win. I asked Bobby Bowden this a year ago, and he tried to put it in perspective. He said the world wouldn't end, but when I asked him, would your resume be incomplete if you never got a national championship? He said yes. How about you? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think in the eyes of a lot of people, uh, that would be the case. Uh, but I really don't tend to measure uh, success or whatever I've accomplished or haven't accomplished in football so much. And, wins and losses. I, I think when, when you die, they always say, well, he won so many, he lost so many, he won so many national championships, or he didn't. And, and yet, I think that's kind of a hollow way to look at it. you feel a kinship at all with guys like Marv Levy, Bud Grant? Great coaches. Grant's in the Hall of Fame. Levy's probably going there. Did everything but win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Similar position to, at least at this moment, where you are. Well, I, I don't know if I feel a kinship, uh, Bob, but I, I'm, I never cease to be amazed that uh, the mentality that, uh, you know, the Minnesota Vikings were losers or that the Buffalo Bills are losers. It's kind of an interesting commentary on our society. It's kind of like if you're not number one, you're nothing. I mean, to win 12 games, to, to go through what our players have gone through this year, I, I admire them greatly. I don't necessarily admire them as a coach. I admire what the players have done in terms of their 
their commitment, their devotion, and their determination to get back down here and to try it again. In our interview, Osborne also said he supported some form of college football playoff. The present bowl coalition and upcoming bowl alliance have improved the chances of crowning a true national champ, but they are at best imperfect. This year's top teams being a perfect example, as both Nebraska and Penn State could wind up undefeated and yet never meet on the field, said Osborne. We've gotten so conscious of payoffs and money, we've almost sold our souls. There should be some way to get it done. Coming up, a tale of three quarterbacks. Nebraska's Tommy Frazier is one. He's back as the starter tonight. And then there's backup Brooke Behringer, 7-0 in relief. And the forgotten man in all of this, Miami's Frank Costa. We'll return to the Orange Bowl after this. Like when they're going in now, it might hurt the offense and scheme, but I don't think, you know, I think it will. But we both do something different. We may have different strengths uh, as far as running and playing football, but I think we're both capable of running the entire Nebraska offense, and, and, uh, and that's all you can ask out of each of us. The question here isn't competence. It's Osborne's intuition. It was Beringer who guided the Cornhuskers back to the big show. So why entrust the team to a player who hasn't taken a snap in a game since September 24th? Probably hasn't played in about nine games, I think. Ready to take him off, it's like that, is he? I've been missing nine games. The option is all timing, so if he's gotten his timing back in the last two weeks, then put him in there. Tommy's been practicing for two months. He's just been on blood thinner, so he couldn't have major contact. But as far as uh, being full speed, running, and executing our offense, he's been doing it all the time, so it isn't like he's rusty or he's stale. Also, Frazier has been here before. At last year's Orange Bowl, he excelled. 283 yards of total offense against Florida State as Nebraska came within two points of the national title. This year began with legitimate Heisman aspirations for Frazier, but then he was suddenly sidelined by blood clots in his right leg. Still, he stayed in shape, hoping. All the hard work that I put in, it, it paid off in no, no way that I was just out there I work hard for nothing. It's like when you have a job and you go work for nothing. That's the way I felt. I hate to get up this way, but it's been a great opportunity for me to get out and, and show what I can do and prove my coaches and teammates that, that I was a capable player. Capable and gutsy. Beringer played part of this season with a collapsed lung. His reward is now unclear. I'm not really sure how much difference it's going to make uh, who comes in when or, or why. Um, you know, hopefully that everybody will be uh, mentally prepared enough to play that it's really not going to make a whole lot of difference who's in and where and when. I bring a tightness, big play capability, something that I always bring to the office since I've been started as a freshman. We're coming to play full three defense with our covers behind us and we're going to line them and play ball. It doesn't matter who they stick back right there. It doesn't matter to us. All right, joining us now, our game analyst, Chris Collinsworth. He'll have the call along with Tom Hammond. Agree or disagree with Tom Osborne's decision? Absolutely agree 100%. You know, Tommy Frazier reminds me of you a little bit. Neither one of you worked that much during football season, but now for the national championship game, it's time for the stars to come out. You know, an excellent analogy, and on that basis, I am sure the young man will excel. Thank you very much. But then you have to go back to what happened last year in this Orange Bowl game. Play for play against Charlie Ward. Tommy Frazier was there, was making the plays and I think he's going to do the same things tonight. All right, let's get the thoughts of our sideline reporter John Dockery who's down there watching the clubs warm up. Doc? Uh, thank you, Bob. I talked to uh, Tommy Frazier a little while ago and he said he's absolutely relaxed, focused, feeling no after effects from the blood cut problem. I also talked to the uh, quarterback coach, Turner Gill, from Nebraska and he said, hey, Frazier will start. He's 100%. He's fine. No problem but that we would definitely see Brooke Beringer in the first half, probably in the first quarter. That's it from the field, Bob. Back to you. Thanks, John. Well, it is an unusual situation when you have a Miami game and the focus is not on the Miami quarterback. After all, five of the school's recent alumni at the position are now playing in the NFL. Frank Costa is the current starter. He's had a stormy career with the Hurricanes, in part because he's been battered by unreasonable expectations. <laughs>
at Miami, winning and winning big is expected. Last season, after a loss to rival Florida State in Game 5, a large measure of the blame was dumped on the team's junior quarterback. He was ripped on the radio and by Miami's vocal football alumni. Frank Costa wound up being benched, and sophomore Ryan Collins replaced him for the remainder of an unspectacular year. The anger of 1993 is still evident. But I wasn't real happy with my situation, and, you know, I wasn't very happy with what happened to me, so, you know, really, uh, there were some negative thoughts toward Coach Erickson, and the coaching staff, and the, the players, and the city of Miami, really, because it seemed like everything was just coming down on me. Such is the price of failure, real or perceived, and the level of expectation at Miami, where notable predecessors include Jim Kelly and Bernie Kosar, who took the Canes to their first national title, and Vinny Testaverde, the 1986 Heisman Trophy winner. It's going to be nice to be nice to see both of those guys. They're great players, but you know, I know all those guys, and they're human beings just like me, and you know what? I can't get trouble for my ass. I have to live the public school to do when they're going to group me however they want to group me. And if you do win a national championship, people are going to respect you. Um, if you don't, then they're going to, you know, bash you apart and, and rip you apart. You know, this game's going to, you know, tell a lot of where I stand in, in the history of Miami quarterback. Although he may not measure up to some of his predecessors at Miami, Costa is still a better passer than either Nebraska's Frazier or Beringer, and he could very well deliver a big game tonight. Now, late yesterday, Tom Osborne injected another element into the Nebraska quarterback debate. Call it the elephant equation. Five elephants appearing in tonight's halftime show. There are the plodding and pungent pachyderms. Well, they tore up parts of the field in rehearsal on Friday. Osborne, somewhat miffed, said if the elephant tracks were too deep, he might have to play the taller Beringer over Frazier. Of course, if the big fellas leave a calling card or two, then Frazier's agility might prove useful. Back after this. Here's the layout. I like it. ProShare Video puts you in touch fast with a Pentium processor inside your PC. <laughs> Working at home must be great. Yeah. The Intel Pentium processor. That's a porcupine fish. Whoa. Programs like Dangerous Creatures make a splash with a Pentium processor inside your PC. What's a piranha? You don't want to know. The Intel Pentium processor. September 24th, as a matter of fact. That's their only loss on this field 
1985, Dennis Erickson could win his third national title if things break right. It would be his third in a six-year tenure. He says he's staying. Our Will McDonough says, take seriously the talk that he could be headed to Seattle and the Seahawks. For sure you can believe the talk that we're headed upstairs to the booth. And our announcers, Tom Hammond and Chris Collinsworth. Tom. All right, thank you, Bob, and Happy New Year, everybody. You know, Chris, we've heard from the coaches, from the quarterbacks, but there's a matchup in this game I think will be crucial to its outcome. It involves the Nebraska offensive line, led by Zach Wiegert, who is the uh, Outland Trophy winner at right tackle. This is a huge line, bigger than some NFL offensive lines, helping the Cornhuskers to the best rushing attack in the nation, 340 yards a game. But they'll be meeting a Miami defense that is the best in college football, giving up just 220 yards total offense a game. And the strength of the Miami defense is right up front, in the person of Warren Sapp, the Lombardi Trophy winner. His coach, Dennis Erickson, says he can dominate a game much like Hurricane defensive line greats of the past like Russell Maryland and Cortez Kennedy. And he can be pretty aggressive, too. I thought he was going to come after you when you asked him if Nebraska could run the ball on Miami. Yeah, when you stood up to run, I think you actually scared him back in his seat. I want to thank you for that. But it's interesting, we were talking to Zach Wieger, the great offensive lineman from Nebraska. He said, you know, we just want to play a physical football game with these guys. Get our body on them, try and push them around, find out who the better man is. And this is a great team to do it against the Miami Hurricanes. They'll just sit there in that 4-3 defense. They're not going to run. They're not going to hide. It'll be one of those matchups. We'll find out who the better man is. And there's one other unit we haven't mentioned, and we should. The Nebraska defense, highly rated, and a different Nebraska defense than we've seen in the past. Absolutely. Well, they're going to be playing the Miami Hurricanes. 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 Absolutely. This is a defense built around speed, especially at the cornerback position. These guys in the past, especially last year against FSU in that Orange Bowl game, proved that they can go against the very best receivers in the country. And even when they got off the line of scrimmage, Baron Miles and Tyrone Williams able to stay right with these guys. We expect that same kind of matchup this evening. And there is a look at Dennis Erickson. He says that he will listen to potential NFL offers after this game. And Tom Osborne, three times he has played for a national championship. How many more times will he have the chance? Miami wins the toss to first of the second half. Nebraska will receive four of the national title. in 98 days. 16 yard return. There was a Miami player shaken up. Kevin Brinkworth. First and 10 to the Nebraska sideline. Back up quarterback Brooke Berenger. He was disappointed he didn't start the game. Tom Osborne's decision, but he says he knows he'll play and play well. All right, John Dockery, Miami, the momentum early. Nebraska got back into it. And I wonder if Joe Paterno is an interested viewer here with a second half yet to come. At the end of the first half, Miami leading Nebraska in the FedEx Orange Bowl 10-7 for halftime. Let's go to Bob Costas. Bob? Boy, Tom, you can bet. Joe Paterno, Kijana Carter, Kerry Collins, all the Nittany Lions. Very interested observers. These are, these are the two best teams, Miami and Nebraska, defensively in terms of points allowed in the country. Very hard to get hot for a sustained period against either. And although Nebraska got back into it in the second quarter, a question will be this. Did they give away the first quarter by starting Frazier? They have moved the ball much better with Beringer in there. Now here's what's ahead on the halftime. Number seven, German, who is deep to receive the kick. First half, Lutzen. And German will... Well, it's the power 
powerful show that has the critics raving, viewers watching in record numbers. Tomorrow night, NBC will show you how it all began. ER, a special two-hour movie event, tomorrow at 9, 8 Central, here on NBC. Well, there has never been a tie. And you notice how young Tom Osborne looked in that initial shot. A few of those wrinkles created by those lost opportunities in the Orange Bowl. And we repeat. Many thought his career was over. 
a potentially life-threatening blood clot in his leg. Comes back, has two different stints, two very different stints in this Orange Bowl game coming on in the second half and leading two touchdown drives. Yeah, you say two different stints, everybody's going to yeah. talk about that, but I don't think there was two different stints. I think Tom Osborne put him in the pickle by calling the pass early in the ball game when the interception occurred. Tommy Frazier should have kept running the ball then, and Nebraska would have dominated throughout the ball game. He came back, and what he did was give them the opportunity to run the option. He opened up that Miami defense that was tired because they'd been chasing around Lawrence Phillips that had run hard the entire game. His ability to come back in the fourth quarter, he did it last year against Florida State and Charlie Ward. He marched his team down the field. That experience is why I felt like all along he should have played the ball game. I don't think there's two cents at all. I think Tom Osborne put him in the bind. Well, after two ineffective series, Beringer came on and looked pretty good early. I don't think a lot of us expected to see Frazier back in the ball game. He was the MVP of the last Orange Bowl. We'll have to see how this vote turns out. You might want to give the entire offensive yeah. line of Nebraska the MVP lead. They really did what they thought they could do, didn't they? They wore down Warren Sapp and company. No question. I'd give them the most valuable player because they laid on them. They 300 pounds. They just kept banging them and banging them and banging them. And then important, they suckered that Warren Sapp across his boom. They stuck him in the ear hole and ran that fullback <laughs> trap. And that was the difference because that won the ball game for them. Nebraska's offensive line dominant Miami meanwhile not able to do anything negative yardage in the fourth quarter Craig we talked about it when they don't have an effective running game they don't win many of these big ball games no they, they do not do that you have 29 yards rushing by those guys and that really was something that hurt them and I think another thing that really hurt Miami was their inability to catch key passes that Frank Costa threw I thought Frank Costa threw the ball extremely well early in the game first half Costa to Marcus Wimberly third down and ten it would have converted he dropped it Again in the fourth quarter, Miami up eight, third down. He drops it. Chris T. Jones, usually dependable. That gave Nebraska the chance to get back into the game because they had the punt, turned the ball back over to them. Nebraska went in, tied the game up. You've got to catch the ball when they throw them like that. And those were all very catchable passes. I think the key part of the ball game was conditioning. In the fourth quarter, the Nebraska defense just wore out the Miami offensive line. They sacked court. They had minus yardage in the fourth quarter because the defensive line from Nebraska was in much better physical condition than those big, fat offensive linemen from Miami. They just outwore them. Something out. very tough for the Hurricanes to stomach. At the start of the fourth quarter, they always hold up four fingers. A lot of teams do that, but Miami really believes that no one can outplay them in the fourth quarter, particularly in their own house. And that was as emphatic a beating in the fourth quarter as we've ever seen in the Orange Bowl by an opponent of Miami. Well, you know, Miami talks about five minutes of hell against Washington. Well, they had 15 minutes of hell, of purgatory, and everything else. In the last 15 minutes, the best football team won Nebraska because they were out conditioned. And I'll tell you what, I think they wanted it more than Miami. They went and got it. You talk about out conditioning. Nebraska, and everybody knows in the country that they are notorious for having a great weight room program. They work extremely hard at being good in the weight room. Their conditioning with weight and with running paid off of them in the heat. Because we were down there this week, and it was humid. And in the fourth quarter, they dominated the ball game. The motto all year long has been unfinished business. They came two points shy last year in the Orange Bowl. The business just about finished. For highlights of the ball game, let's go back to Dan. Thank you, Chris. On Sunday night in Miami, the foe was familiar. So was the scenario. When Nebraska met Miami in the 1984 Orange Bowl, Tom Osborne was a win away from the national title. Eleven years later, Osborne was still a win away from his first national title when the Huskers renewed old acquaintances with the Canes. To the Orange Bowl, we take you. And there is Coach Tom, one and seven in Orange Bowls. Osborne tabbing Tommy Frazier as his starting QB, but Nebraska went three and out. Frazier deep picked off by Carlos Jones in Nebraska's second possession. Osborne quickly goes to Brooke Berenger, and Berenger seemed ready. First quarter, the other QB, Frank Costa going to work, looking for A.C. Tellison. Trent Jones going 35 yards for the score. Miami led it 10 to nothing. Home field advantage, 10 point lead. They look like they had the momentum. Nebraska goes to Miami's 19 yard line and they try to capitalize. Beringer, Mark Gilman, 10 7 Miami. Some of that cockiness deflating, perhaps. Miami still led 10 7 at the break. Second half, Miami's first break. Costa goes to Jonathan Harris, 17 7. 44 yards on the score. And once again, Miami looked like they would put it out of reach. Still in the third, Nebraska's defense. Miami at their own three. Costa. Say hello to Dwayne Harris. 17-9 Miami. Nebraska 
on Miami's 32 and Beringer. Muff the handoff to Lawrence Phillips who fumbles. It's recovered by James Burgess. So Miami leading 17-9. They've got the ball. Time winding down in the third. Well, Berenger on the side. Frazier comes in. It's still 17-9. And Corey Schlesinger, 17-15 Miami. Nebraska goes for a two-point conversion. Tom, of course, remembers the 1984 Orange Bowl when he went for two and didn't get it. 17-17. Frazier to Eric Alford. Frazier again. Frazier feeling the confidence. Scrambles for 25 yards on a third and four from his own 48. He's pumped. So is his team. Miami looks extremely tired. Schlesinger again busting up the gut. 24-17 Nebraska. Nebraska and Tom Osborne finally win the orange. More importantly, for Tom Osborne, he finally wins a national title. Congratulations to one of the class acts in all of college football. Some questionable calls, I'm sure, for Coach Osborne, including the... Uh, first and goal from the three when he had the pass picked off. Brooke Berenger uh, intercepted there. Ten and two is how Miami ends. Warren Sapp dominating in this game for three quarters, running out of gas. Following the game, though, Mike Tirico spoke with Tommy Frazier. Tommy, how sweet is this? I believe that's what was going to happen, and it did. Were you down after you came out and Brooke came in? No, I wasn't down. The coach said that Brooke was going to go in sometime late first, second, early second quarter. And what? He was doing good. He was going to stay in. So I just had an official way to pay you. What you guys do in the second half differently? Nothing. We just go out and run our offense. We knew that we'd get it. We just ran our offense. Do you believe that you beat them here? Yes, I believe them. I said I love going to beat them here. That's not unbeatable here. We beat them. Yeah. If you want to find the national title, just follow Nebraska. Every year since the bowl structure began, when Nebraska has finished the regular season undefeated, either the Huskers or their bowl opponent has gone on to earn the national championship. We will get back to the Orange Bowl for more a little later, but first, the Sunday conversation. George Foreman. In his world, it's good to be king. Everything in George's world is... The only team that lost to, uh, the only team I should say that uh, beat Colorado this year was Nebraska. The Buffaloes in the feet. They played a hell of a game. Good enough to congratulate those guys. Well, when I signed here, that's one of the things that I really wanted to do was come in here and win that championship. Last year, it avoided me, but this year, it didn't. We'll have to see what happens on the vote. But I think because it is a ballot box decision, uh, you know, I tend to have a little bit more of an even keel uh, on these things. I, you know, I, if they give it to us, we'll be very grateful, and we certainly will take it home. But if they don't, well, we'll understand that too. But I'll always be proud of the way we play. To the pros now, we're Chicago and Oh, yeah, baby! Woo! The Bryce offensive lineman Joel Wilkes. So the celebration that started just after midnight Eastern time and continued long into the South Florida morning as Nebraska looks like we'll finally win a national championship. We'll talk to Coach Tom Osborne in a couple of minutes. First, let's take a look back at another facet of last night's game. Of the 67 offensive snaps, Burke Barringer took 40. Tommy Frazier took 27, the decisive 27 as it ended up. And when you take a look, this was really a microcosm of his entire season. A long, agonizing wait for Tommy Frazier, who finally got a chance to play out the scenario that he thought would happen in the national title game. That's what he said on television. He said he's going to come out there and lead our team to the national championship, and he did that. There was a, a set plan at the beginning to, to go with Tommy through most of the first quarter, uh, bring Brook Brooke in uh, late in the first quarter or at the beginning of the second, and that's basically what happened. Tommy Frazier had waited three months for a chance to return to the field, and after 13 first quarter snaps this Orange Bowl night, Frazier had three yards rush, one interception, and one seat back on the bench. I was very confused, you know, because I was wondering, hey, I went out there, I wasn't doing bad, and here I'm not too serious, I'm on the sideline. But, you know, Coach Gear came up to me and told me that just stay focused, that, hey, he's out there moving the team well, that I might, if I get my opportunity to come, they're going to give me the call and go back out there and do what I can do best. He wasn't down, I guess he was more like frustrated, and he just needed a boost, and when Brooke went in, it was doing great, and Tommy came in, and it was the middle of the game, just like the middle of Nebraska's season, found Brooke Berenger at quarterback. The junior moved the team on a couple of drives, but his key mistakes left Tom Osborne with a decision. Fourth quarter, trailing by eight. Title hopes again faded. The coach went back to his starter for just his third series in three months. Just kind of an instinctive move. It wasn't any plan, and Turner and I talked about it on the sideline, Turner Gill, and we thought it was time to put Tommy in, and Tommy responded very well. 
Despite a nagging cold, Frazier's fresh legs, his late game quickness, and option ability open up creases for Corey Schlesinger's game tying and winning touchdown. Tommy Frazier's running the option. Who will you like if you're a linebacker, who are you gonna focus on? You know, you're gonna say, well, I gotta stop Tommy Frazier. And then, you know, Tommy starts giving the ball inside, they're overrunning the fullback, and it showed, and Corey ran wild on him. It's a pretty long year for you. Yeah, it's been a long year, and it's went in. And joining us now, Nebraska coach Tom Osborne, uh, a thought on Tommy Frazier, not his in-game performance, but the way he personally handled a very difficult season for a young man. I thought Tommy showed a lot of maturity. Uh, you know, at, at one point there was some question, uh, uh, worst case scenario, where whether he'd ever play again or not uh, with those blood clots, and uh, he uh, never seemed to waver, uh, never uh, powdered around, or felt sorry for himself. Uh, went through a fairly difficult regimen of uh, shots for Coumadin and, and uh, you know various blood thinners. And, I guess, according to what the medical people say, he was a great patient, and uh, he really prepared himself well for this game. A couple of quick thoughts from you, personally. Was there a moment, are you the ultimate team man? Was there a moment last night when you got by yourself, you and your wife, and just realized that finally you accomplished something that has been so long sought after? Well, uh, yeah, we obviously thought about it. I, I guess the boat isn't in yet, so I don't, <laughs> but you never say, uh, you never say never, or whatever, but Certainly it was gratifying to see our team play the way they did and uh, to come from behind and beat Miami in Miami. It's a, that's a challenge, you know. So we were, we were really pleased with the whole season and particularly the way they, they responded last night. Quite a bit of adversity. Two quick ones. The polls, you promised Joe Paterno you wouldn't politic, and you guys have done that all the way through. Uh, do you feel that there's uh, any way that Nebraska won't be national champion? Well, yeah. I, you know, Joe and his team, they're going to play great today, I'm sure. And so uh, who knows what will happen. Uh, people are going to have to, to vote. Joe's got a great football team. I, I, I wish we could have played. I, I wish some way we could get that done. You know? For you, back on the recruiting trail, we continue to coach. Is this a point where you'd stop and say, let me look back and wonder if I want to keep doing this? I'll look back for a couple hours. I'll be out on the road tomorrow. And so uh, and I enjoy, co enjoy coaching. Nothing else I'd rather do. Tom Osborne, congratulations. Thanks for joining us. Let's go back to Chris Fowler. Chris? Mike, thank you. Osborne silencing those whispers that have been heard in the state of Nebraska for the past couple of months that he might retire if his team won the title. By the way, last night in Lincoln, fans to Memorial Stadium wanted to rip down the goalposts. They were too late. They'd already been taken down for the winner. Osborne, a cautious man, but here's why we think it's a foregone conclusion that Nebraska will win the national championship when the polls come out tomorrow. The margin over Penn State was pretty convincing. They had uh, 26 more first place votes. In the uh, coaches poll, the Associated Press poll was a little bit closer, but uh, most of the national media that have votes were watching the Orange Bowl last night and had to be impressed. Is that the way it should work out? Is that the way it will work out, in your opinion? Well, let's take a look at how we got here in this situation. Last October, there was a split poll. Penn State and Nebraska both had one of the polls. Then Nebraska beat Kansas. Penn State beat Indiana. But it, the perception was it was a very close game, where it actually wasn't. Actually, Penn State lost the chance at the national title with a Hail Mary pass, or else they'd have got their number one. Unfortunately, and that's yeah. the way voters look at it. They see the box scores, they don't look into the game, know what happened there. And I agree with Tom Osborne. Unfortunately for him, it's not going to happen. He will not play against the Penn State team. And that's the same statement that Joe Paterno will make after this ball game today. He'll beat Oregon, and he's going to say, Boy, I wish we could play a great Nebraska team. It'd be a dynamite shootout. All year long, the pollsters have been impressed more by defense than by big scores. Nebraska's defense great again last night. But Patrick, a field goal that hooked just to the left and maybe some officiating calls. They lost to Florida State by two points. All year long, the motto was unfinished business. Consider the business finished after last night's game against the Hurricanes in their own house. Osborne starting Tommy Frazier. The decision didn't look good early. Frazier throws deep on first down after the Huskers had driven well on the ground. It is picked off. Barringer warms up, replaces Frazier after two series. Meanwhile, the Hurricanes offense is humming. Frank Costa flips it out to Trent Jones, who gets in the end zone. 10-0 after one quarter. Then it was 10-7. Then 17-9 after a safety. Barringer following a messed up punt by Miami. The first play following that throws the interception. Barringer out, Frazier back in. The second play of the first drive when Frazier came back to the ball game, Schlesinger gets in the end zone. Nebraska back within two. Oh, to have a two-point conversion 11 years ago. Instead, he gets one right here to tie the game at 17. Nebraska gets the ball back. Frazier on the action again. Keeps it. 25 yards. 
Miami's defensive line just getting worn down. Warren Sapp played well, but the Husker O-line too much. They trap Miami's defensive line. Schlesinger gets in the end zone. That's the winning touchdown. Tom Osborne, a cautious man. He's not counting the national championship just yet. When the hosts come in tomorrow, Nebraska's lead, if anything, should grow in the fold. Afterwards, we asked Tommy Frazier about how he felt Husker's dominating in the fourth quarter, offensively the defense doing a great job, Miami not converting a third down, and Frazier talked about coming back in the ballgame after being removed in the one quarter. I was very confused, you know, because I was wondering, hey, I went out there, I wasn't doing bad, and now here I'm not too serious, I'm on the sideline, but you know, Coach Gill came up to me and told me that just stay focused, that hey, he's out there moving the team well, that I might, mean, if I get my opportunity to come, they're going to give me the call and go back out and do what I can do best. We just felt like uh, maybe Tommy, uh, his quickness, maybe an option or two uh, in that fourth quarter would help us. And so uh, just kind of an instinctive move. It wasn't any plan. And Turner and I talked about it on the sideline, Turner Gill, and we thought it was time to put Tommy in, and Tommy responded very well. Were you doing some different things when Tommy came back in that helped open the fullback eventually yeah. in those two touchdowns? A little more options. I think the, the thing we had done is we had about 23, 24 practices and really had conditioned hard. And we felt, uh, Mike, that if we were close going in the fourth quarter, we'd have a great chance in this ball game because we're a pretty strong physical team and sometimes we, uh, we just wear people down a little bit with our running game. And so uh, I think some of that happened. And I'm not in any way uh, knocking Miami. They've got a tremendous defense, but uh, we sometimes the two-yard gains in the first quarter become five and six uh, in the fourth quarter, and that's what happened. In the fourth quarter, I was just physically exhausted and didn't you know have much energy left to even get the ball downfield. And my arm was very tired. And, you know, I guess they just kept getting up out of habit. Two consecutive drives, they won the score. They won the ball game. Yeah. That's what they had to do, and that's what they did. Yeah, I think America wants to see Nebraska play against Penn State. That's not going to happen. Craig, we talked about Nebraska's dominant offensive line wearing down the Canes, but they've had a lot of teams over the years with great offensive lines. Why was this Nebraska team able to get the job done? I think just, just the conditioning level in their defense. I think the defense was underrated going into this ball game, and Miami's inability to run the football really hurt them. You saw where Frank Costa was sacked five times. That really doesn't tell the story. This guy was hit throughout the ball game. And in terms of Miami and that running game or lack of, I thought in the fourth quarter when they couldn't get off the goal line, when they couldn't establish any momentum, that killed the Miami Hurricanes. And they had to resort to the pass on third and long. And there's no way you can do against that against a team like Nebraska secondary. Well, Craig, Nebraska's Hall of Fame coach Bob Devaney told me in, our, in Colorado on October 29th, this was the finest Oh, on Nebraska team, he'd ever seen the Nebraska, he's been there for 45 years, that said it all. Interesting point here, Bobby Bowden wins his first national championship at the expense of Tom Osborne last year. Ha! Tom Osborne gets his in Miami this time, poetic justice. Tom Osborne, a very cautious man though, you know. He got it. All precincts have not reported, but I think Nebraska had a pretty significant lead in both polls. So we get into this ball game, and if you beat Miami that impressively in their house in the fourth quarter, it's hard to imagine the pollsters flip-flopping, but then again, anything can happen in the poll system. Coming back, we'll talk about the Rose Bowl. As Penn State watched last night in frustration, they prepared for the Oregon Ducks. We'll check in in half the end with the latest from there. We continue at halftime. For the courthouse, and the coaches poll, an emphatic margin and a huge sentiment for Tom Osborne among the coaches. The AP poll is a little bit closer. The margin is 15 points. Huskers had 14 more first place votes, but many of the media who vote in the AP poll were covering the Orange Bowl game, so that's obviously a key factor there. We'll have to wait and see when the poll releases it. Williams and Lynch in the backfield. Barker's going to pass. Then it was Blessinger again, this time from 14 yards out to field the 24-17 victory for Nebraska. The MVP honors for Frazier and a probable first national championship for Tom Osborne. I really pleased the way the team played. Really pleased the way they played the fourth quarter. I guess this one game erases everything. The seven previous games that we lost, when we came in here more than Miami, the team that said we had one point on the dog, they said we couldn't do it, but we proved everyone wrong. The final poll results will be announced tomorrow and should make it official that Tom Osborne has captured his first national title in 22 years as head coach at Nebraska. And we've noticed that by the pool, some of the students down here have been cramming 
not for finals, but for the CBS Sports Ultimate College Football Quiz. And we will put you to the test. ...today with a surefire national championship under their belt. For at least one Sioux Falls family, that means driving home the victory using their garage. If Nebraska had lost last night, the plan was to cover this mural with a black blanket. But since the Cornhuskers won, a number one sign is the only addition. The Pro Image Shop in Sioux the Empire Mall says that it will be the first one with championship shirts available for Nebraska, possibly as early as tomorrow. The store says the owner has a huge, is a huge Nebraska fan, and he wants them just as soon as possible. Well, from the Cornhuskers and today's results. Next. 17-7 Miami, you missed a comeback which should assure the Cornhuskers their first national championship in 23 years. An unsung hero emerged in the fourth quarter, fullback Corey Schlesinger. He went 15 yards for a touchdown here to make it 17-15. Miami still had the lead, but then the Huskers went for two. Tommy Frazier sets up and hits his man over the middle. That's Eric Alford. Tom Osborne's team had it tied up 17-all. Osborne's toughest decision really all week, and everyone asked him about when to play Frazier, when to play Barringer. Well, in the fourth, it was Tommy. There's a 25-yard pickup, and to stop the option, he must stop the fullback Flexinger with the game-winning touchdown right there. Nebraska wins it by seven. The final was 24-17. to what, what, what would it mean to you to win a national championship? Would, would you feel like a whole person there? <laughs> Hey, I felt like a whole person all the time, but uh, we'll have to take a new angle you know, next year. I enjoyed national championships as much uh, as an assistant coach as I did this one, if we have one of them, indeed. But uh, the process was really more important. I, I've enjoyed the season. I've enjoyed the way the players have responded. And uh, naturally, if, if we do get a trophy at the end, that frosting on the cake. Oh, worth it. Kajana and the Nittany Lions make it a pretty good spot to be in on Monday, following the Cornhuskers' victory over Miami at the Orange Bowl in the Orange Bowl. Back in Lincoln, Nebraska Governor Ben Nelson called the game's final 15 minutes the greatest fourth quarter in Nebraska football history, and with it, according to the coaches' poll, a national championship. And you wouldn't get an argument here. 15,000 just packed their sports center. Tommy Frazier, Brooke Berenger went home for some quality family time. Tom Osborne, the man so many were so happy for, showed up the way he'd wanted to for 22 years as a national champ. I wasn't one of those people who was pulling against Penn State. I imagine there are some Nebraskans who were hoping that Penn State would lose. And, but um, I didn't feel that way at all. Probably celebrate by going somewhere and trying to catch a bonefish or something like that. Really wild, really crazy. Uh, uh, explosion emotionally, I guess. Those comments actually before the official coaches poll came out. Nebraska, they picked up, they go from 44 first place votes in the last poll to 54. Where did they get those extra 10? Well, they got them from Penn State, who dropped 10. Colorado, 3. So Bill McCartney, in his last season at the school, gets them a number three ranking, Alabama four, Florida State at number five. Still the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl, Penn State and Oregon. Would Nebraska's win have any effect on the Nittany Lions mentally? Joe Paterno looking for his 16th bowl win, or Rich Brooks was just looking for number one. The nation's number one offense explodes. First play from scrimmage, Kajana Carter right at you. 83 yards, into your living room for a touchdown, put the Lions up seven to nothing. Would Oregon's Danny O'Neill duck his head and hide? I don't think so. O'Neill, with a big passing day, hits Josh Wilcox, 33 yards, down to the Penn State one. O'Neill, play action. Might as well give it to the guy who got you there. Wilcox, the one-yard score. The game tied at seven. And Joe Pa knew he was in a football game. Third quarter, Penn State up seven. Kerry Collins under a heavy rush. He's picked off by Reggie Jordan. Jordan rumbles down to the Lions' 17-yard line. That set up O'Neill. Watch the beauty lob to Kristen McLemore, who skies for the 17-yard touchdown tied at 14. With the momentum shifts on the ensuing kickoff. Ambrose Fletcher follows the wedge, breaks the kicker Matt Belden's tackle, and races 72 yards before Isaac Walker able to tackle him down from behind at the 21. That set up Kajana Carter. The scamper, 17 yards untouched for the Penn State touchdown. 21-14, Penn State. 
At that point, Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions go on to win it by a score of 38-20. to 20. Penn State, the first undefeated, untied team to win a Rose Bowl since Ohio State did it in 1968. The Buckeyes, well, they were number one that year. This was Joe Paterno's fifth undefeated season in 29 years in Happy Valley, but only one of the five have brought him a national championship. And I'm not telling you I was tough for a week or anybody tonight, but I don't think we should get a rap that we have not played a tough schedule, nor would I want to put that rap on Nebraska. I think both teams are very, very fine football teams, and it's a shame either both of them can't be national champs, so we can't have a playoff. We did all we had to do. We went 11 0. The October schedule in Nebraska did uh, in the regular season. We won the Rose Bowl by 18 points. I mean, what, what more can we do to get a national championship? It's a shame we're not going to get it. I've been an inspiration to myself, the rest of the team, and national championship coach this year. Good, all the, we gave them all their points. The defense, I think they only had one drive. We did not come here to, to give a good fight and go home with a smile on our face. We came here to win and win only, and uh, second place is not good enough for us. We're disappointed. More on Danny O'Neill, who shared MVP honors with Kajana Carter. O'Neill, 41 of 61, 456 yards, is at the passing yardage record in the Pasadena Bowl game. Ironically, the four names and numbers you see before you, all that yardage, all four of those quarterbacks lost their respective games. Two INTs really hurt O'Neill. Correct. Sure, that both polls came out the way they were supposed to with Nebraska number one. Apparently, that's where Tom Osborne and I differ. I was asleep, and uh, somebody called three in the morning or something like that. I think from the coaches' poll and notified us that we had uh, been named champions. But I, I really uh, didn't worry about it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I was like Thomas Dewey. I just uh, figured the votes would come out, and I went to bed. Congratulations, Tom. I think you did a super job, and you know how I feel about you and about your team. I think you've got a great football team, and if we can arrange it, let's play in about ten days. All right, Tom.